Um, I'm really excited to get to introduce actually the next two uh, presentations, the first by Diego. Um, I, I'll just say, I think, I think Diego is doing such interesting work. I, I, and we really first kind of encountered each other as thinkers last year in my network culture seminar. And I really started to see uh, Diego just pick up in really interesting ways on intersections of disciplines, you know, sort of on the one hand, a little bit being inspired by some STS stuff, but thinking through kind of uh, in other ways, kind of classic media studies question. So I'm really excited about this thesis because I think it pulls together a, a several really interesting threads in a really unique way. So I, I hope you enjoy it and I will turn it over to you, Diego. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, can everyone see it? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, so this is the the title of my of my of my thesis, uh, and as it, as the title says, uh, it's basically about the intersection of like media and like a little bit of like SDS and also probably economic sociology or something like that. So uh, I will take you through this journey. So please bear with me. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so to begin with, uh, what is the Peruvian miracle? So uh, the Peruvian miracle uh, as, as it has been defined by economists is like this period of growth, of GDP growth between 2002 and 2012, that it was the largest uh, cumulative GDP growth uh, per capita in a century in the country. So um, what I'm basically uh, referring to is this the line of the, you can see in this chart, right? It's like this like uh, really pronounced growth of, of the GDP per capita in the country. Uh, so why I'm why I'm interrogating this and uh, why I'm doing this uh, from like a media perspective? Uh, well, th there are, there are two uh, important facts here, and the the first one is that some people have been critiquing this idea of like the the miracle actually happening. Uh, mainly, there there are different types of, of critiques, but I, I will like narrow it down to like. Uh, they, this, this critiques take, the, take this idea as something that is uh, monolithic and this, this like almost hegemonic narrative of uh, we are like growing and everything is going great, but uh, this is not the true, but like since this narrative is everywhere, we are like all practically being dominated by this idea. Uh, of course, this has come into question with COVID-19 and the pandemic. But this, the, I, I, my, I'm suggesting here that we can notice this before the pandemic, right? We can notice this before uh, this uh, uh, crisis. And uh, and what, what I'm basing, what, what I'm taking uh, as a as a base to argue this is that uh, through the last uh, four or five years, we can notice that there were some fissures. In the last two, uh, in the last two governments. Uh, so, what am I doing exactly? Is kind of like a detailed description of how uh, this economic narrative is uh, basically in entangled with uh, politics, and these are really uh, two different. Uh, there, these are these are not two different uh, things that go each one in the way, but. These are two different. These are uh, two aspects of the same uh, of the same coin. Two faces of the same coin, if you want to use that term. And when we uh, notice that, uh, we can notice that the string of the nar uh, the string of the narrative of a miracle is it's it's not it's not that uh, it's not that great or is is it's not as solid as it has been argued that it is. And, and, and actually, if we take a step back and start to question the, the, the strength of the narrative, we, we can see some cracks and we can see some fissures between, uh, between actors that supposedly were on the same side of like arguing that everything is going great, and et cetera. 
So, and what I am not doing is trying to see if the miracle really existed because I'm not into like fact checking or, or anything like that. I'm, I'm also not trying to say that uh, economics is only like a mask for politics or uh, it's only like an like a like a like a facade of politics. Uh, I'm arguing that economics and politics are entangled and kind of like technical and the social are entangled. And I, I'm I'm not also trying to like uh, inter make an interpretation of, of this or like I'm building an, an ideology. So uh, and this is kind of like what am I arguing about? Like of course if now we are seeing that. Uh, the, the, the pandemic crisis has uh, struck Peru like really, really hard with like the highest uh, excess of the per million or like the, the largest uh, global economic crash and like with economic, uh, political and economic instability. Of course, seeing that you can, you can say, oh, of course, this was never, th this was never real. And it, it, you can see people disputing these facts in, in, me, in Peruvian media. Um, but my uh, what I'm suggesting is that if we if we go back, uh, we can see that even in media you can see that the the narrative of the of the miracle was never that solid. So uh, I, I I go back to the to the to the context and, and the origins of the miracle, and uh, I I what I do first in my thesis is to trace back the miracle, but I don't I don't go to the to the to the 2002 or like the beginning of the GDP growth, but I go back to the 90s, uh, and that's because it's, it's in the 90s where the 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 free market principles of the Peruvian economy were installed uh, during the authoritarian regime of Alberto Fujimori, and and this is and this is when you can find kind of like the origins of the miracle in like international media making association between like the catastrophic uh, state of the Peruvian economy uh, coming out of the 80s and these reforms of uh, this free market principles reform, like kind of like making a, 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 a miraculous recovery of the of the Peruvian miracle. And I'm, I, I'm concentrating in international media because uh, a, lot of, a lot of the talk in, in Peru about like the Peruvian economy being a miracle uh, draws from like, a, a, external sources saying like, oh, here, look how people like uh, economists uh, that, uh, that appear in like magazines like The Economist or um, uh, newspapers like The Wall Street Journal, etc. Look at how they see us, look how they talk about us. And they see this like a, a source of legitimacy for what they are arguing. So uh, basically what I, what I do at the beginning is like, how how do we get from from the 90s from the uh, from the start of the Alberto Fujimori's regime uh, to like this story of success and and like kind of like the this rack to riches story as this piece says. So uh, I will not go through all the, the the story because that would take a lot of time, but this these were the findings of my like. This exploration of this uh, 22 years of coverage of like uh, the Peruvian miracle in, in Anglo-American media. Uh, first of all, is like there is a narrative uh, uh, that talks about a subordination of politics to economics. And what I mean by this is that uh, when uh, Alberto Fujimori uh, takes power, he is portrayed as, as somebody with a lot of like uh, Power to like enact certain changes in uh, in the in the Peruvian uh, economy uh, and make these free market reforms. Uh, and by making these free market reforms, he uh, kind of like installs uh, economic order that after even after he leaves, uh, is the these reforms are not then changed in the subsequent governments. Uh, even though the the, the subsequent the subsequent governments were like people that were opposed to to Fujimori's government, and that's why I I, I talk about like uh, uh, a subordination of politics to economics and like politics 
uh, can can be like changing and everything. But the, the narrative says that th these all these uh, political changes are subordinated to uh, the economic order, and uh, and this is uh, uh, what what I mean when I talk about like a consensus over a decade, like, like the government of Alberto Fujimori uh, lasted uh, ten years, and uh, over over these ten years uh, there was uh, it was a consensus was built about what is the correct way of of managing the economy and these pre economic principles got entrenched and uh, and they were not longer like a possible way of of like going out of these economic principles and uh and even though when there were there were political uh, moments of political destabilization uh these were moments that were described by this narrative as this is stabilizing for the economy, not like for uh, the, how the population uh, perceive or how the population uh, thought about their own well-being. But all of this, like if there were political uh, uh, disruptions, if there were disruptive for the economy. So there is always like a like a like a dominance of what we are like what we what this what the economy is doing for. Uh, sorry for what the politics are doing for the economy. So, like being said that, uh, then the 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 next step I, I, is the what theoretical framework I use to approach controversies in media. Because uh, what 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 I what I want to do is that okay, we have this narrative about like how there is this predominance of of uh, economics over politics, but let's see how that reflects on like actual controversies in in Peruvian media. And because if like if one takes this narrative as face value, if you move to me to media and see controversies about the economy, one will see or uh, one should see that like there are two clear sides and people are the elite. Uh, have a, a like a solid argument that they don't make disputes or, or they don't have fights between each other, but they have like a coherent uh, discourse about like what is, what is right, what is wrong and what should be rejected uh, or what sh should not have a space in, in the economic narrative. So uh, to approach the controversies that I analyze in my thesis, I, I have like, uh, there is a large theoretical work that I use, but I, I want to focus on two points. Uh, the first one is uh, the economy as a socio-technical construction. And what, one important thing to notice is that when we talk about economy, we, we mostly talk about GDP. And uh, this is something that has been uh, studied by a lot of people, but I, I take the approach uh, by Timothy Mitchell that talks about how uh, GDP made uh, possible to actually talk about the economy. It, it, like it gave it, uh, like a, it turned it into a discursive object. Uh, he he argues, like when we talk about the economy, when we talk about the economy growing or the, the economy decreasing, we actually talking about like how GDP, uh, that is this really a specific uh, number that has its origins in like England and the United States. Uh, in the middle of the, uh, in the interwar and the second world war period, uh, then is used, uh, how this object then is used to talk about the economy in every other country in the success in the subsequent decades, right? And, and, by, in, and by talking about the, the, the economy, uh, uh, one introduces the future as a tool of government because we always talk about GDP growing, GDP decreasing, and GDP uh, being kind of like this tool of government of like, oh, okay, if we, if we take these actions, if we take these measures, then like the economy is going to be in the future uh, bad or the future and which will be better, right? So uh, this, this focus on numbers introduces uh, narratives in, 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 in our way of life or what, what, how we understand. They are not just 
numbers, uh, purely rational numbers, but they are, uh, 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 as I said, like they introduce the, the estimation or, or how do we project our future is going to be. And this is something that uh, Michelle Murphy calls a uh, uh, phantagrasm and like how these quantitative practices are imbued by affect and uh, how we many times uh, project our fears and uh, and our expectatives and into what these numbers tell us about our future, for example, in the case of the GDP. And um, the second point that I want to make is uh, about the relationship between media and, uh, and expertise. And there, 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 is, there, there, are, there is a bunch of literature talking about this, but I, I want to focus on, on like the role of expertise and numbers. And uh, I think we have to understand numbers also as ways of interbeing in, in the public sphere, not, not just like by actual interventions, but just as producing numbers that are going, that are going to be public are also ways of interbeing apart from like, of course, op-eds and interviews, et cetera. Uh, so, uh, um, and, and also when experts do actual interventions like in, in media, et cetera, these are, uh, these are uh, interventions that are not just uh, neutral, but they are uh, made by experts that are given floor by, by certain media but in certain places, right? It's not, just, it's not just economic expertise being dominant by itself, it's like, certain economic expertise being dominant uh, in certain media. And this is certain expertise that is very specific. So uh, this process of like total economization of our lives has to be taken with uh, more carefully, I, I argue. So uh, me the methodological framework that I use for these controversies are uh, basically based in, in STS in science and Sociology of Science Studies, a Sociology of Science in knowledge. Uh, and, and I basically, I basically, uh, I take like an agnostic approach to this controversy. So I don't like a priori assume that there is a, there is a right and a wrong side, but I take, uh, I want to see how their arguments take traction and uh, how they gain traction and how uh, their arguments are finally if we can use this word successful for the purposes of the actors that are trying to mobilize uh, them in, in media, right? And, and by, by analyzing uh, the arguments that, that these uh, experts and economists are making, uh, uh, I, I use, uh, uh, to, to analyze this, I use the a framework uh, or a theory known as actor network theory in which I, had, I, I see how, or I try to see how these economies enroll uh, allies that, and by, and by allies, I don't mean like uh, just an, cite, citing another economist, but how do they enroll, for example, a chart or for example, a number. Uh, these are not uh, actors. We don't have to understand actors just as human actors, but also as non-human actors. Um, and uh, well, and why I try, why I'm doing this, like why why I'm like trying to see if 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 the if this is an, in any sense meaningful is because uh, the, there there is uh, there is kind of like an abundant uh, talk about the economy or uh, the economy or the, the stories of economic success of uh, stories of economic miracles in economic literature. Uh, but in the other hand, uh, studies about how uh, economic miracles in, uh, 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 are portrayed in nonfiction media are as really scant. And this is, this is something that has been noticed by uh, people doing his, his history of social science. And, 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 in their, uh, and they, they themselves recognize that in some cases, uh, people doing history of social science uh, tend to like understand really well like academic debates, debates happening in journals, for example, or, or like people in, 
in certain institutions, like, but, uh, but there, there is not enough attention to what economics is doing in action and in like in a wider sense, right? And, and this is something that, for example, Diego Mata argues that to understand economics in, and in action, we have to study media. And uh, so I don't, I won't go through each of the controversies because that will, be, that will take too much time. Uh, but uh, I, I would just describe some conclusions uh, and I will take examples from the controversies. Uh, the first controversy takes place from 2016 to 2017. And uh, I, in, in this first uh, controversy, I ask uh, how do we, how does media allows political confrontations to take a, a, a technical turn? In the second controversy from January uh, 28, 2017 to March 2018, my main question is how media separates uh, uh, expertise into some somehow valid expertise and invalid expertise, but this valid or invalid nation are not just based on technical uh, on technical uh, notions. And uh, in in 2019. Uh, this, this is the shortest uh, controversy. Uh, I, I try to see how controversies uh, uh, actually reach a closure because in, in the previous two ones, that like, controversies do not reach one. And the, the third one is actually a controversy that happens not between economic uh, experts, but uh, kind of like uh, journalists and business, uh, business persons that actually reaches a, 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 a closure. So to jump to the conclusions and lessons, because as I said, I will not go through each of the controversies that will take too much time. Uh, but one, one of the conclusions that I take after doing this analysis of these controversies is that uh, what the, the role of media in, in learning these controversies is, uh, in, in studying these controversies is like huge. Uh, and actually this kind of like goes back to the point of made by Tiago Mata that to understand economics in action, we have to see how, how moves, how, how argument, economic arguments are being mobilized through media. And, and, and by media, I don't mean just kind of like the technical structures, but I, I take this kind of like inspiration, if you want to, if we want to use the word from this, this guideline that uh, media is like the technical form, but it's also associated protocols. And um, for example, in, in the case of protocols, uh, there is kind of like this discretionary technopolitical filtering of expertise that I was referring previously, in which uh, it's not exercised by media, the materiality of media itself, but like by the actors that, are, that give floor or that allow certain expertise to be or not be in media, right? So uh, media does not, media as general does not privilege economic expertise or, or quantitative expertise uh, like in, in general. It, 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 uh, it gives preference to certain uh, economic expertise and to certain economic uh, ex experts, uh, but very specific reasons, right? Um, but in, and in the in the in the other side of uh, talking about like technological forms, uh, I want to emphasize the importance of the speed of media and like the role of media in these controversies is is really it couldn't have happened the way it happened uh, unless uh, it happened in this uh, actual media ecosystem. And I will, I will, uh, I will point. Uh, I will use an example to, to illustrate this. Uh, so, uh, for example, in, in one one of the episodes of, of the of the of the of one controversy, we can see that uh, what one of one of the uh, uh, a minister of economy was using a chart and and that was trying to portray how. Uh, deficit was uh, growing from month to month. And, and the, in the following day, uh, the, the other economist that was the, the former minister of economy who was being responsibilized by uh, this uh, de deficit growing and was making an argument about how this chart was wrong. And 
by the moment he was making that argument, one one of the one of the uh, one of the viewers tweeted uh, the chart that was used by the previous uh, by, by the in the previous intervention, but by the other economists, uh, saying like, "Oh, you should say that this chart is wrong, right?" And and the and the the former the former minister of economy that was being interviewed live uh, said like, "Oh, okay, like leave that chart there. I will explain why that chart is wrong, right?" And and uh, he proceeded to explain what this chart is from. But I, with this example, I want to illustrate that this kind of like exchange between uh, uh, arguments and, and charts and like artifacts could not have happened if there wasn't like people watching this uh, 24 hours uh, news channel that has like a Twitter account that receives uh, the, the input from people viewing the, the discussions. and. And uh, with, with all this kind of like accelerated media, uh, media ecosystem, actually, I, I, I argue in my thesis that brings uh, numbers and this and facts to real, uh, to give them enough realness. And what, what, what I, use, I use this concept that I take from John Law that uh, by, by making certain, certain appearances and gaining certain speed, these numbers and facts actually uh, gain enough realness to 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 and to be used as some as a justification for certain economic policies. Uh, for for the next lesson and uh, and and this is kind of like an an, an important one. It's like I, I'm trying to conceive uh, the miracle as a socio technical narrative and. What, what, what I'm trying to say with this is that uh, these are not lies or like kind of like just something that um, is made up, right? Uh, that just like gains a speed and gains realness through circulation in media. But what I'm trying to argue with this is that there, these are actually like entities that require technical knowledge, technical work, and that are created with like the involvement of uh, an assemblage of like persons and techniques and materiality and that they are portrayed and they circulate through actual technological networks and it and this is this is for this is all to say that the, i conceive them as social technical non fictions as something that is not like real as the reflection of what is out there, but they are neither a uh, fiction as like something that is not real, like just made up. Uh, actually, these are something in between in the transition in the transition from one state to another, and uh, to put it in in a, in a certain way. Uh, and but by 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 saying this is that I'm, one important consequence of saying this is that the the uh, is if Mitchell was was saying that. Introducing these socio-technical non-fictions uh, to government is actually introducing the future as government. Uh, it actually it actually also introduces, I, I argue, affective states as a tool of government, because our 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 hopes, our 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 dreams, if you will, and our our fears about like what is going to happen with the economy in the in the future are also affected by. By these kind of socio-technical non fictions that are uh, that are constructed by these larger uh, processes of circulation of, of information. And, and here's another example of this is, uh, and it may look like really convoluted, but uh, th these are typical material that uh, happen to appear in this type of in this type of publications of business. Uh, that are actually projections, and there is so there is a lot of talk about projections and estimations, and but these estimations and projections are not just made following a, a pure calculation, but they are actually they are actually bets, and they are actually um, kind of like uh, hopes of also of the of the people making them, and and 
and I'm not like just making this up and this is actually what these people said. Like people said like, my projection is this because I'm betting that this is going to happen because I'm betting that this is going to happen or because I am hoping that this is not going to, to, to take place, right? And for example, in one of the projections in, in the top was, was made by hoping that in 2017, there was not going to be floods in Peru. And what happened? There were the largest floods in like three decades. So, <laughs> and, and also like there was a projection in, later in, in another moment, there was a projection of, this is a projection of what is going to, uh, of what GDP growth is going to be if the president is not impeached. What happened? Then the president was impeached. And then the next president two years later was also impeached. So, and so all this, all this, it, all this is to say, oh, well, and then there is also these polls that also uh, always measure the optimism of the people, kind of like the mood of the economy, of the economy, we want to call it that way, that are not actually, like, are not actually based in something real, like in the sense of like something that is out there, but it's actually the, the, the fears or, or the concerns that people have, right? So, but these are actually taken into account by other people to make projections. So what I'm trying to say with this is that we should be careful uh, of like assigning a technical, uh, just a poor technical power to, 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 the, to these sectors that use these numbers. And we should, we should be aware that they are, they are kind of like using uh, what I call like a techno social bricolage of like something that involves calculations, but also that involves fears, concerns, etc. And the, the third conclusion and lesson is that uh, it, 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 this talks about like assigning power uh, uh, to, to, to certain actors. It, and and uh, as observed through, through the lens of media, uh, these economic experts are, appear, appear to be in this array. Like they are disputing each other, they are fighting each other every time. And they are not like a monolithic uh, collective or a monolithic uh, consensus of like people having the, the, the very same uh, narrative about what is happening, right? Even if they are supposedly just facts and supposedly just technical details. And so, so I'm, what I'm trying to say with this is like, uh, as researchers, we, we should have to be, uh, uh, we should acknowledge how, uh, uh, how the, how we conceive the objects of our interrogation and a priori assuming certain, certain like strengths or, or say a certain level of, uh, of like power in people and, or in actors uh, is not only kind of like from a political standpoint, of course, uh, deficit, de deficits, but, but it also kind of like demonstrates that per perhaps we are not being like, uh, we are not interrogating this object or these narratives like in a more detailed way, right? So, uh, well, and this is something that has been argued like for 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 decades. It's not something that I just made up. And and one one way to escape this is so as Calon, Michel Calon and Bruno Latour argue is that we should probably situate ourselves as researchers, not like and just in the level of macro social of like just like ideologies and narratives and um, like institutions and but neither at the level of just actors because like institutions actually exist and they have consequences right but we should we should be aware of like how these processes from 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 of movements of like from macro social to micro social have and uh and this is this is for example why this is the last uh, example concrete example that I have, uh, and this happened in one of the in one of the controversies that I analyzed. Um, and the 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 minister of economy in that time in 20, 2016, uh, kind of like uh, spread some rumors about his predecessor, and when he was confronted, he instead of like instead of like going outside and like, or I don't know, giving a, a formal communication, he 
<laughs> he made a Facebook status in his personal Facebook account. And then this was uh, screenshotted and then was posted in the official Twitter account of the Ministry of, of, of Economy. And then there was like this large uh, Twitter thread, just like posting threads from the personal profile from this person, like say apologizing or well, it was a very bad apology. But it, but it, by doing this kind of like all the, all the kind of like power of like this institution, the Ministry of Economy that was uh, conceived as this very powerful entity that like put like really well-defined uh, economic rules and economic order in the country sort of like falls apart and you can see that actually it's a really precarious entity in the sense of that it, the, the, this, mis, this mystical veil of like power uh, is not that real and it's actually kind of like in the hands of people that are willing to, to, to use it for personal reasons, right? So in this sense, the, the people that were being accused of the, the rumors were about like his predecessors installing people by just not following technical criteria, but uh, by, po by political orders, following political orders, kind of like reverse. And the people that, that were making the accusations that were using rumors actually were kind of like more in the political side that, rather than the technical side that actually in, in the past followed kind of like this mystique of like of the narrative of the economic miracle. And uh, as, a, as a final, uh, and this is the, my final uh, uh, lesson, conclusion, uh, and, and this is relates to, to the previous one, it's about the power of the economy. And, uh, and talking about the economy as something that has a powerful explanatory uh, force kind of like uh, occludes certain uh, actions and, and forces that take place between uh, actors. And and oh, and here I'm 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 quoting Bruno Latour by saying that maybe it's not that we should kind of like use power as an exploratory force, but we should probably try to explain how power came to be, like by following these processes of like how actors invoke the power of like institutions or how uh, they invoke the power of certain forces. And, and by making the, by tracing these movements of like from macro social to micro social, what they call translation is what, how we should probably give a better explanation than just, uh, uh, than just like turning to like power or like ideology or, or certain other objects that are usually found in, 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 in social science research. And, and this actually, Kind of like also goes in hand with Murphy, Michelle's Murphy explanation that uh, Michelle's Murphy argument that the economy is not that what should do what should the economy is that which must be explained. It's not which does the explaining. Um, and and that's all. That's that's all I have. Thank you. All right, thank you. And let's open it for questions. Yeah, William. Yeah, so Diego, thanks. That's that's exciting. And I mean, I, your, your last slide is like totally on the money. Um, how economists have been able to sort of stand outside as a, as, a, as a priesthood and exempt themselves from like everything that's happening in social science is beyond my comprehension and they do it. And I guess it's because when you think about what the value of a Bitcoin is or what the value of your retirement portfolio in stocks is, it's quantified belief. It's nothing more or less than quantified belief, you know, to the second or third decimal point. Uh, futures are nothing but that kind of hope and belief. Um, so, so just to say a, a big, a big yes. I put a note in there that you were talking about the, the in the '90s the shift from a kind of 
the way in which uh, economic discourse overrode or, or a, a political. There's a political shift, but the same kind of economy, economic logic, the truth of numbers prevails. And made a note that said, yeah, there seems to be a shift from, from words, the power of words to the power of numbers. And, and just to, to think through this techno-social ensemble, um, it's also like the 90s when the internet becomes kind of actualized. I mean, it's around before, obviously, as a deep history, but, but really kind of pervasive. And with that spread, um, my guess, and this is pure conjecture, my guess is that, uh, you know, the multinational finance firms, the notions of expertise really goes global fast. And, and that discourse of numbers and that disaggregation of a kind of priesthood of numbers from the the political engagement with you know whatever whatever passes as truth in their world that i think is writ large across the planet we see the same thing happening in the us uh in the switch from bush to to clinton where clinton basically maintains shift in social policies for sure but the economic uh stance i mean Clinton could have been a Republican in a way. You see the same thing happening in Britain with Blair when he follows up with John, the, the, the Thatcherite John Major thing. Blair keeps that, that, you know, we can, I look back, I would call it neoliberalism, but in fact, maybe it's about a kind of expertise, professionalization, uh, a, a separation at that level that's enabled by global flows of a very particular kind of knowledge the ability to model this stuff on the fly because you can kick up the graphics right away. You, you know, you're trading with, with kinds of information you never would have had in real time, let's say in the 1980s. So I'm just wondering if that technology, that to be very literal about it, if that kind of technology, the, the, the internet, um, is, is a factor here. Uh, yeah, I, I, will, I will say that it, it, that it has a lot, a lot of it. Uh, so, uh, I, I will say that the, the kind of like spreading or like putting notions in circulation wouldn't have happened without the, the power of like this economic network. And, and for example, uh, there, there is a lot of like influence from like people doing these reforms in, 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 in certain places uh, from, uh, uh, I, I believe universities, et cetera. Right, and but this this in the past or probably in eighties nineties had to be like brought by certain actors, specific actors, right? But but now what we have is like this these uh, numbers or these rankings actually rankings are also not, are also important here. Just going straight from 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 the north to the south, like as as soon as they. As, as soon as they are they are out like uh, you 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 name it it's like the the ranking of like which country is the more has the more free or the freer economy and it, as soon as it come out in, in in north and you have it in peru the, the, and uh, instantly right so I, I would say that of course that there is a, as we become more connected in in like in the world literally in the world the, the 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 power of these numbers and, and these rankings and these notions is because it's growing ever or it's ever growing right? at least that's that's my take and uh, that's also I, I think something that we we can actually take from my thesis uh, I don't make I don't make that exact argument because I don't make I, I don't study the, the the circulation precisely in the internet but I would say that as these networks become like uh, ever growing, the the the, the, pro the probably the probability is that these notions and these um, numbers become ever more powerful. Any other questions? Tia. Okay. Hi. Um... It's I I really love the ambition of this work, Diego. Sorry, the dog is, the dog decided to come here. I really love the ambition of this work and trying to sort of bring together media studies with STS. And so I have maybe a reductionistic question, but I'm curious. Like after going through this whole process, are you able to learn? Like, what do we gain by like maybe thinking in terms of the non-human these things as non-humans? 
rather than just media representations? Like, is there something about that Latourian STS language that you find you would sort of distill as particularly generative? Or, or would you actually not use the non-human language for, for, some of, for some of this stuff? Uh, one, one of the, I think one, one of the ways I try to use the, 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 the notion of the non-human actors is that it's not only, uh, it's not only uh, other economies having authority outside that are brought into the discussions, but are actually numbers themselves and charts and all these like non-human devices actually uh, that came into into circulation and by by I don't I don't want to say that by themselves because because they circulate through actually social technical assemblages is that they, these non-human entities gain power and gain traction so. Uh, I, I would say that that's that's the most kind of like how I approach to this uh, to this topic from that from that perspective is that we probably should take into account the power of these social technical entities if we if we want to name it that way uh, as having as having kind of like this uh, as coming into reality not necessarily by because they are named by these really famous economies, specific economies in, in like in a global north country, but because they circulate through, through some networks. Uh, and these networks are also an assemblage of like not only human persons, but also uh, kind of like larger, lar larger networks of like enterprises and companies and also and also humans, right? So I would say that having this this uh, this uh, notion uh, really present or having it really into account actually uh, let us see that it, this is this is bigger than or this is something else that just a discussion between just one person versus another person but this is like one person invocating a network of, of allies that probably are humans and probably are not uh, and other other actor invocating another network of allies kind of like uh, going against each other. All right, thank you.